Brothers and sisters, please open your Bibles and turn with me to Psalm 41. Psalm 41. This morning we have reached somewhat of a a milestone within the book. I think I began preaching from the book of Psalms. I think it was back in 2016 when I kind of joined the uh, the preaching rotation in that respect. So it's only taken us five years to get here. Uh, and if I do my math correctly, and we get maybe four or five, let's go up to eight chapters a year, because this is kind of our summer series, we're only going to be here for another 10 to 20 years. Um, but we are making progress. Uh, we have reached a milestone this morning. We have actually come to the conclusion of the first section uh, in the book of Psalms. There's actually five books uh, that make up the book of Psalms. Uh, and scholars believe that these five different books correspond to the first five books of the Old Testament. And so some have called this the Pentateuch of David. Well, if that is the case, uh, then the first book of Psalms emphasizes that which is found in the book of Genesis. Uh, the book of Genesis, which emphasizes the creative power of God Almighty. Uh, the power He used uh, to bring all things into existence, to, to form all things out of nothing, uh, to separate the light from the darkness, uh, to create dry land and, and the seas, to, to create every living creature including man and woman. Genesis is a book which proclaims the sovereignty of God over all that He has made. It reminds us that He is a God, a God who is high and exalted, uh, who has no peer, uh, no one who stands beside Him. He reigns and He reigns alone. And even though He is the transcendent one. He is a God who cares for His people. A God who cares for His own. And He continues to, to demonstrate that, that great concern uh, for all His people. That care extends to nations, whether they are great or small. It is offered to, uh, to individuals uh, all kinds of people who come from all kinds of different places. It's poured out on nobles and on peasants. It's given to the strong and to the weak. It's experienced by sinners and saints alike. And our, our text for this morning reflects that same concern. Uh, in putting pen to paper, uh, David concludes this first section by communicating one central truth. And here it is, that when the people of God reflect the heart of God, when the people of God reflect the heart of God, they can experience, they can be confident that they will experience the blessings of God. See, God loves those who are created in His image and likeness. He has a heart. He has a soft spot for the poor and the helpless. And so consequently, when His people reflect the heart of God, they can expect the blessings of God. With that in mind, let's stand for the reading of God's Word. Let's stand to read Psalm 41. We'll begin at verse 1 and, and read to the end of the chapter. So let's read together. Psalm 41. Again, you'll notice that this was written by King David. It was written for the choir director, uh, meaning that it was given for the instruction of God's people so that it might inform you and I here this morning. So listen closely to the word of the Lord. David writes, How blessed is he who considers the helpless. The Lord will deliver him in a day of trouble. The Lord will protect him and keep him alive, and he shall be called blessed upon the earth. And the Lord will not give him over to the desires of his enemies. The Lord will sustain him on his sickbed. In his illness, you, you, O Lord, restore him to health. 
As for me, I said, O Lord, be gracious to me. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against you. My enemies speak evil against me. When will he die and his name perish? And when he comes to see me, he speaks falsehood. His heart gathers wickedness to itself. When he goes outside, he tells it. All who hate me whisper together against me. Against me they devise my hurt, saying, A wicked thing is poured out upon him, that, that when he lies down, he will not rise up, rise up again. Even my close friend, in whom I trusted, uh, who ate my bread, he has lifted up his heel against me. But you, O Lord, be gracious to me and raise me up, that I may repay them. By the, this I know that you are pleased with me, because my enemy does not shout and triumph over me. As for me, you with uphold me in my integrity, and you set me in your presence forever. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. Let's bow together. Father in heaven, the psalmist said, give me understanding according to your word. And that is our desire here this morning. Father, that the same spirit who prompted David, who moved David to, to inscribe these words so many years ago, that that same spirit would cause them to, to come alive in our hearts and minds today. That he would sharpen our minds and soften our hearts uh, to receive this message. That he would cause us to, to understand these things clearly and, and to apply them consistently in, in our lives so that we might bring you the glory and honor that you are due a glory and honor that comes from a faithful, obedient people, those who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb for this very purpose. And so we ask all these things in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks, brothers and sisters. Please be seated. Brothers and sisters, tell me about the state of your heart. Tell me how you feel about your neighbors, your co-workers. What would you say if you were given the assurance that they wouldn't hear what you said? If they could not read your innermost thoughts concerning them? What do you really think about the down and outers? Uh, those living on the fringe of society? Is it scorn or is it compassion? Does your heart swell with warm affection or are you cold and, and callous to their plight? Those are not easy questions. Those are not kind questions. I, I understand that. But we can't avoid them because they really lie at the very core of David's song this morning. Because as we discover, it is those who reflect the heart of God that will experience his blessing. And David wants us to understand uh, that message. And so what he has done is he has arranged his, his psalm, his hymn here, in really three distinct parts. It begins with theology. It then moves into a time of trial. Uh, it then moves through that to a time of trust or to a time of thanksgiving or, or to put it a, a different way. Uh, we might say that David begins with his conviction in, in verses 1, 2, and 3. And then in verses nine through uh, 4 through 9, we're introduced to a time of crisis in his life. He'll then end on a note of confidence. So whether, whichever way you want to, you want to put it, uh, theology, trial, thanksgiving, or uh, his conviction, his crisis, his 
uh, his confidence. We'll leave it up to you, but that's kind of how he divides this, this text. And he does this to show us that when our heart beats, as the heart of God beats, then we can have the confidence that we can, will experience his blessing. So David begins by, by expressing then his conviction, really the same wor- way that, that the Psalms open up. It, it, it begins with a, a beatitude. Psalm 1 states, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel uh, of the wicked. Now at the tail end of this first section, we have this, this, other, this, this other beatitude. How blessed is the man who considers the helpless. This short maxim really governs the the psalm as a whole. This is the theme that runs throughout, the, 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 the thread that ties it all together. God will bless, he'll, he'll make happy uh, those who, who help the poor. And that term is, is somewhat elastic, very stretchy. It, it covers kind of a multiplicity of, of things. It describes not only those who, who lack material possessions, they're, they're poor materially in that respect, but it also refers to those who are weak in bodily strength. Uh, those who are despised in terms of their reputation. Uh, it, it looks at those who are despondent in spirit. These individuals are often on the fringes. Uh, they may have trouble balancing their checkbook or holding down a job. Uh, they may seem a little fearful, more fearful than others. Uh, They may have been hurt in the past. Uh, They may be disillusioned with life. And and so they kind of sit back. Uh, They live life in the shadows. And so it's easy to overlook these people. It's easy to dismiss them. uh, To say that they're really just a a product of, of their own circumstances of their own making. It's easy to shove them aside. But what we're told here is that the the blessed man not only sees a poor man or a poor woman or a poor family, he also takes time to consider them. The word means more than, than showing concern for someone or something. It implies careful reflection a thoughtful attitude that results in a right course of action. Those who consider the poor do not just have warm feelings. They give time and attention to discover what should be done to help these individuals. I like what Spurgeon said. He said, they do not toss a penny and go on their way, but inquire into the sorrows of the poor. They sift out their causes. They study the best ways for their relief and practically come to their rescue. Such as these have the mark of divine favor plainly upon them and are as surely the sheep of the Lord's pasture as if they wore a brand on their foreheads. And then he says, note well, they are not said to have considered the poor, uh, poor years ago. But they still do so. It continues. It's ongoing. Those who pursue this course of action do in fact reflect the heart of God. Remember, this is the one, our God, is the one who is described as the father of the fatherless. The judge for the widows. He is the God who makes a home for the lonely, who, who leads the prisoners into prosperity. The God of heaven it expressed this same concern when he sent the Lord Jesus to save rebel sinners. 
we're explicitly told in the book of Romans. That is while we were still helpless. That Christ died for sinners. It was not when we were at our best. It was not when we were deserving. It's not because we reached some sort of benchmark. He, became, he came because we were helpless and hopeless, weak, unable to extract ourselves from that condition. It's no wonder then that God ministers to those who follow in his footsteps. Observe the many blessings that are enumerated in verses 1, 2, and 3. The Lord will deliver him in a day of trouble. The Lord will protect him and keep him alive. Uh, and he shall be blessed on the earth. Uh, the Lord will not give him over to the desire of his enemies. The Lord will sustain him on his sickbed. In his illness, you restore him to hell. I, I, I note how absolute these phrases are. It's not that the Lord will equip you to do these things. It's not that he'll give you the strength or the wisdom. He actually does. It. From beginning to end, this is... This is His work. This is the measure of His grace. We need to understand something here, that David is not expressing that his, his personal confidence. This is actually something stronger, something more solid. The reality is, is, is that this is biblical theology. That which is taken directly out of the pages of Scripture. See, these are the promises that are drawn out of the biblical text. They are found in the Abrahamic covenant, in the Mosaic covenant. They're found in the Davidic covenant. That's what we were reading when we read Deuteronomy chapter 28. We see elements of that directly in this song. So David's not relying on some pie in the high, pie in the sky hope. He's not giving those warm and fuzzy feelings, just hoping this is going to is going to happen. No, he is relying on the bedrock of Scripture. That's where his hope is found. And so it is this conviction, these theological truths, that will sustain him during a, a great and difficult time in his life. Verses 4 through 9 present a time of crisis. A time when David's theology was put to the test. Look at the king's report in verse, verses 4 and 5. As for me, I said, so this is looking back at the past. He's making an application then. As for me, I said, O oh Lord, be gracious to me. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against you. My enemies speak evil against me. When will he die? And his name perish. What was it that brought the great king down? This giant killer. This man of action. This man who never lost a battle in his lifetime, but went from victory to victory to victory. A man who was able to form a nation out of 12 squabbling tribes and to, to fashion them into an international powerhouse. So much so that when his son takes over, kings of the earth are coming to them just to see how they do it. How they have made such a, a vast empire for themselves. How is it that this exalted monarch has been laid low? What is the cause of this debilitating illness that, that restricts him to his sickbed? Well, David identifies the source, doesn't he? 
He says, it is my iniquity, my sin, my transgression. He draws a direct correlation between his physical condition and his spiritual state. He does not ask the Lord to heal his body because that is just a symptom of a deeper problem. He has sinned against the Lord. And so he pleads with the Almighty Physician to address the root cause and to heal his soul. Because if that doesn't happen, nothing else matters. Now we all know, I think, since the invention of the microscope, since the development of germ theory, uh, that modern man is somewhat resistant, hesitant to, to draw a clear line between a patient's physical condition and their spiritual state. And to be clear, we need to understand that all, not all sickness is a result of personal sin, at least on the, in, the, the individual basis for that sickness. We, we need to understand that sickness has come into creation as a result of the fall. This is the consequence of that sin. But not every instance of sickness can, can be attributed to, to some sin that we have performed in the course of everyday life. And we know that because of the Lord's own testimony uh, in, uh, in the book of John, chapter 9. It's there that we read of the man who was born blind. And when his disciples uh, questioned him concerning the state of this man and his condition, Jesus is emphatic in his response. He tells them that this man is not this way because of any sin that he has performed. It's not because of any sin of his parents. Actually, God, in His infinite wisdom, according to His sovereign plan, God made this man this way so that the works of God might be performed or demonstrated in him. So not all sin, or not all sickness is a, or ailments, not all disease is a result of personal sin. But having said that, we need to recognize that there are cases. Sometimes it is the case that sickness is the result of personal sin. And, and we see actually evidence of that in Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians. And the account that is given there, that which is described in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, is, is actually quite poignant uh, in, in light of our discussion this morning. We know the passage. Uh, we know what it says beginning in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27, uh, that Paul admonishes believers to observe, not to observe the Lord's table in an unworthy manner. He says this, he says, but a man should examine himself, and in so doing, uh, and in doing so, he is to eat the bread and the, drink the cup. And he says, for he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many of you are weak and sick, and a number of you sleep. He's not saying that they're taking a nap. He's not saying that they're taking a breather from Sunday morning service. He is saying they're dead. They've gone to sleep and they will not be waking up. Now we typically read Paul's admonition here as a call for us to confess our past sins or, or maybe to, uh, as a directive to consider what is represented in the, in the wine and the bread. And I think we are right in doing so. But that was not Paul's primary focus here. That's actually not what he is saying here. See, Paul was addressing a specific sin that had infected the, the Corinthian church. The wealthy members of, of, of the church, those who were rich, those who were self-employed, they had failed to judge the body rightly. This is not a statement concerning the physical body of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not a statement concerning uh, the symbolic elements of the Lord's Supper. 
It's a reference actually to the church, to, to the body of Christ, capital B. See, these individuals were gathering on the Lord's Day to celebrate the Lord's Supper, but they were not waiting for their poorer brothers and sisters. They feasted while the slaves, uh, the weak and the insignificant, labored in the fields. They fed their gullets while others sweated. And yet Christ died for those same men and women. His blood was shed. His body broken. So that those poor individuals might be redeemed and brought into the family of God. So that they might actually participate on equal footing with each and every other believer. So that they might share what was called the bread of fellowship. The aristocratic wing of the church had failed to appreciate that fact. They were greedy and impatient. They filled their bellies and left nothing for the lower class. That explains why Paul concludes that section the way he does. Listen to what he says. So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. He says, if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. So that you will not come together for judgment. The remaining matters I will arrange when I come. So don't be fooled. Sometimes sickness is a direct result of sin. Recognizing this fact, James Johnson offers, I think, some helpful advice for us. He writes this. He says, if you come down with a serious illness, the Holy Spirit might point out to you an area of sin in your life. He says, maybe it is a long-term sin that you're not willing to confess or to give up. Maybe it is a grave sin that is bringing great hurt on others or shame to the body of Christ. Don't let yourself worry that every cold you catch this winter is because of sin in your life. That would be going overboard. If God is disciplining you with sickness, He will make that plain to you because His whole purpose is to help you turn from sin and to make you holy. So if the Holy Spirit does prompt you, David's words then are an appropriate prayer for you to make your own. O oh Lord, be gracious to me. Heal me, for I have sinned against you. David prayed that prayer in a season of sickness. But notice it was also a time of treachery. Look at what he writes in verses 6 through 9. And when he comes, my enemy comes to see me, he speaks falsehood. His heart gathers wickedness to itself. When he goes outside, he tells it. All who hate me whisper together against me. Against me they devise my hurt, saying, A wicked thing is poured out upon him. And when he lies down, he will not rise up again. Even my close friend, in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, he has lifted up his heel against me. While David was lying on his sickbed, someone within the royal household took advantage of the situation. Uh, they sought to elevate themselves. Uh, at, at first, it was probably subtle. Uh, they came to the alien to visit the the alien monarch. They they brought flowers. They sat down and, and shared the latest news. They, they reminisced about past exploits, the great accomplishments they, they achieved on the battlefield, the victories they had won. And yet as time wore on, as David's condition continued to decline, they sought to make the best 
of a bad situation. It may have started off with a few innocent comments here and there, but soon enough those words became a full-fledged whisper campaign. Uh, gaining insight from the royal physicians, uh, observing what they had seen with their own eyes. This friend claimed that the king was dying, that his disease was terminal, that this was the judgment of God for all past crimes. In fact, the wording of the text seems to suggest that it's even worse than that. It, it, this is a wicked thing. This is a thing of Belial, is how it would be rendered in the original. It's almost as if he's attributing this to demonic forces. And so in the wake of the king's imminent demise, this individual conspires with others to take matters into their own hands to use it to exalt themselves. Now we don't know exactly who David is referring to in these verses. Who was this close friend? Uh, most commentators will suggest that this was Ahithophel, uh, David's uh, closest advisor, the man who switched sides during the, uh, the treasonous rebellion of Absalom. That is the majority position. I understand that, but I'm not really convinced of that. There's a couple of reasons for that, because one of them is we're not told that David was sick during that time in his life. Not only that, but from the text here, it seems to be that this person was visiting on a regular basis. Uh, he was there in the midst of this time. Uh, what we know from the biblical record is that at this particular point in time, Ahithophel was, was at home. He was living in the city of Gilo his own hometown. Uh, so I would, I would tentatively posit a, a different individual. I think he's referring to Joab. It was during David's later years when he was old and advanced in age. It was during the time of 1 Kings chapter 1 when David could not keep himself warm, uh, when he was confined to his quarters, and, and they brought in uh, Abishag, the, the Shunammite, to, to lay in his bed simply to keep him warm. That, that was the heating blanket in those days because David was so sick. It was during that time that Joab conspired with Abiathar, the priest, to make Adonijah, king instead of Solomon. This was a painful defection. Joab had been with David from the very beginning. Uh, he was David's top general, his fiercest defender. David spent more time with him around the campfire than with anyone else bar none. He was more than a friend. Joab was David's nephew. He was his own flesh and blood. So this was a devastating blow. Uh, it, it came from an ally who became his enemy. A, a man who had watched his back for decades is now plunging the knife deeper and deeper inside. And it came at a time when David was at his weakest. I think this makes David's confidence all that more remarkable. Beginning at verse 10, the king begins to rally. Look at what he says. But you, O Lord, be gracious to me and raise me up that I may repay them. By this I know that you are pleased with me, because my enemy does not shout in triumph over me. As for me, you uphold me in my integrity. You set me in your presence forever. David was confident that God would help him in his time of weakness. In his time of trouble. This was not a vain hope. This was a hope rooted in what David knows to be true. Grounded in the bedrock of who God is. He knows that God is kind and compassionate to the poor and to the helpless. 
And that is who David is at this present time. He's the textbook definition. His picture is there in the Jewish encyclopedia. He knows that God is concerned about the Hebrew people. He knows that he is concerned about those whom he has chosen as the apple of his eye. And so David pleads with the Lord to be gracious. He, he asks the Lord to extend mercy by raising the king up so that he might repay those who have risen against him. I do not think that this is a cry of vengeance. It's the cry of a king who has his people's best interests at heart. See, Adonijah was a schemer. A man who wanted to step out of, out of his father's shadow and to make a name for himself. He wanted fame and power. And it didn't matter where it came from or how he got it. We'll see him doing this again uh, later on in 1 Kings chapter 2. And he'll do it with Solomon, even when Solomon tells him, don't do it. Be careful how you conduct yourself but he just can't help himself. This is who he is. He's the schemer. And so having cultivated the king's closest confidants, he is willing to make the most of any opportunity. And mark it well, he would have been a disastrous king. He would have not have been a kind and gentle shepherd. He would have been a butcher. Using people for his own self-interest. The people needed a wise king. A king who would govern the people with truth and fairness. A king who would seek to walk in the ways of the Lord and to keep his statutes and his ordinances and his testimonies. They needed Solomon. They needed Solomon. Throughout his life, David acted with integrity. That doesn't mean that he was perfect. Far from it. David actually admits that within this text itself. So he's not reflecting, he's not, when he uses, speaks of his integrity, he is not speaking of his own blameless nature, that he is the paragon of virtue. No, what he's telling us is here, despite all of his faults and failures, and there are many, what he's telling us here is that he sought the glory of God and the good of his people. And having served the Lord faithfully in the past, he was confident that the Lord would continue to uphold him in the present so that he might set things right. So that the people would be well cared for in his absence. And we know he's looking forward to that day. Because he'll end, actually, this section by speaking of himself being in the presence of the Lord forever. The fact that we have this psalm is actually a testimony of God's faithfulness. Apparently, the Lord did restore the psalmist, at least for a particular period of time. And so David's confidence was well placed. The Lord helped the one who had helped others. That's what he does. God blesses those who reflect his heart for the poor and the helpless. Brothers and sisters, as we close our time this morning, I want to challenge you to reflect the heart of God by showing, to, showing kindness to the poor and the helpless around us. In saying that, I am not not necessarily encouraging you to, to volunteer at the, the local food bank or at the closest homeless shelter, although that, that would be perfectly fine. Nothing wrong with that. What I'm suggesting is that you make an effort to invest your life in those who are struggling around you. That's what David did. 
I think that was the secret to his success. If you doubt this, I want you to consider the makeup of his first independent army. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 22, tells us that while David was on the run from King Saul, he became the captain of some 400 men. These were not the cream of the crop. These were not Israel's green berets. The greatest shock troops man has ever known. They were the opposite of that. We're told that everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, everyone who was discontented gathered to him. What a motley crew this is. This is the rabble of society. And yet, David will take this ragtag group of misfits and he will develop them into his mighty men. He showed them kindness and compassion. Uh, he taught them discipline and structure and, and patience. Uh, he showed them how to love the Lord, and to follow his ways. David brought out the best in others, rich or poor, Jewish or not. Read the list of the mighty men. Read how many of them are not Jewish. They're so poor, they're so impoverished, they leave their own countries to come to Israel. Who takes them in? David. A man after God's own heart. David considered those around him. Now, I want to encourage you to do the same as an expression of God's care and concern for others. That you would take notice of someone on the fringes. That you would write them an email. That you would invite them out for a cup of coffee. Uh, that you would develop some sort of relationship with them so that you might speak into their lives, uh, that that influence would not be restricted to, to one particular area, that it would be holistic, that that care would be expressed not only for their physical well-being, but for their spiritual well-being as well. That you might be able you might be used of God to point them to the hope that is yours in Christ. Don't do it to improve your spiritual resume. Don't do it to secure your position or to keep yourself from a time of trouble in the future. Do it because you want to develop a heart that beats in sync with the Father's. Do it because you recognize who you were apart from Christ. That at one time you were hopeless. You were weak. That you were a stranger, an outcast from the grace of God until someone stepped in. Until someone was led by the Holy Spirit to declare the hope that is in Christ. Be that person to the honor and glory of God. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you once again for your word. We pray that it might have its effect this morning. Father, that we would be con convinced of the need around us. That you would open our eyes to truly see our neighbor. To observe their state, their struggles. Father, help us to 
really appreciate the sacrifice of your son. What it has accomplished for us and how it might be applied to the lives of others. And Father, that, that would drive us. That it would compel us to share the gospel message. That friends and families, our, our neighbors, co-workers, would be brought to faith in your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That they would know that the confident assurance that, that can be theirs, both here and now in this present time, but an assurance that trans that that goes beyond that, but extends to eternity itself. Help us not to be miserly in that, or to cower in that, but to go in, in, in the boldness, to go in the strength that you give us through the ministry of your Holy Spirit. We ask this so the church might grow, so that it might expand, so that your glory might be displayed both here and now. We ask this all in Christ's most precious name. Amen.